family today. Is that okay? Because we are family. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Father's heart. And when you see the title of the message, you can tend to think maybe because I've become a new dad that I, I'm going to speak about the heart of a dad and, and all of that. But in fact, I want to speak differently than that. I've learned over the last number of years, decade or so, that one of the highest levels of or highest responsibilities of sonship is to convey or interpret and translate the heart of a father. A son interprets and translates the heart of a father. Jesus, in fact, expressed himself the same way. He did what he saw and heard his father doing. He sought to glorify his father. And as we know, Pastor Doug, Pastor Dad, Dad is fighting for a miracle. And I'm happy to say this morning, he's not fighting for that miracle. He's hanging on to a word. He's hanging on to a word. And uh, he's moved beyond striving. He's moved to a higher dimension, a higher dimension of faith. You know, when you come to the end of facts, that's where faith begins. Is it true? And so, oftentimes, we connect our emotions to facts. We are an emotional people. We connect our emotions to facts, yet biblically, you just can't read a page of the Bible without having to connect yourself, your emotions, to faith. And this is the walk that Dad is on. And I want to I declare to you this morning, he, he has shared with us, and, and as you know, he's heard a word from God. And... That's what I love about Christianity, is it just takes a word. Whether it's peace, be still, I am, whatever it is, it just takes a word. We've got a whole Bible filled with words, and Dad is holding on to a word. And I want to declare that Dad will be healed, whether he walks this earth for the next 20 years or walks into heaven, cancer will not defeat Amen. Pastor Doug. Can I get an amen? amen? Hallelujah. And I want to increase your, your faith this morning as we walk through this. We are holding on to a miracle. Dad is forerunning a miracle. He's holding on to a word. And as a church family, we're behind him, aren't we? Would you join your faith with his faith? Would you commit to that? I want to express to you this morning, and I, I think the culture here is you guys preach from your cell phones, if that's what I've seen. I... So I got my cell phone here. Is that okay? I've still got a Bible in it, but I want to speak to you about the, the heart of a father, and I want to give just five simple points this morning, speaking as, as family. Of course, you know the scripture quite well, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. If you don't have time to get there, I'm sure it will appear somewhere with today's technology, we're about ready to have holograms or something. It'll appear somewhere, but I'll read it to you just in case you don't have it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15 says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though, here's the famous scripture, for though you have countless guides or teachers in Christ, you do not have many fathers. What's the value of a father? When something is a little more rare, it increases the value, doesn't it? When something is rare. And I've learned that the ability to recognize a father in the house or appreciate a father is absolutely key to stepping into your inheritance as sons and daughters. The value of a father. We have a father in this house. Our father is contending for a miracle. We're praying for a father. Pastor Leon and I sit and he asks it about my father, I ask him about my father. You know, we talk about the father. And a father is a very powerful position. Do you know that a mother cannot become a father? A woman can't be a father. A woman can be a mother, but only a, a man, a father, can be a father. And when we look as far back as Genesis and we see laid out the foundations of family, the foundations of mankind, we see that God made man first. Some people have taken and manipulated that scripture to sort of say that maybe man is superior to woman, 
or man is more important, or we try to figure out why God made, made man first, but the real truth, do you want the real Schneiderian truth here? The real truth, <laughs> let, let me give you the Schneiderian and then the, no, 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 let me give you theological first. <laughs> the real truth of why God made man first is because man is a father. A man is meant to be a father, and a father is a foundation on which you build everything else. A, 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 a father is a foundation on which you build a family. And so the foundation carries the glory of the building. The foundation is what gets worked on the most. The digging goes on underground. There's a foundation being prepared to hold the glory of this beautiful uh, uh, building or this beautiful whatever. Now, Schneiderian for, version, I happen to believe and I, I've only been married a year, but I happen to believe that, that the woman is the most powerful creature God ever created. I don't say that to earn points with you. I really believe it. In fact, she's so powerful, so beautiful, so unique, such a life-giving spirit that God had to make man to be a foundation and a covering for all of her power. I think you might have missed that or you didn't like it. I don't know. <laughs> but man becomes the foundation for the glory that is the family. And so I say all that to say that when a father comes into a situation, the situation can change. How a father handles trouble in the home makes all the difference for the family, doesn't it? How a father handles crisis in a church, how a father leads during, this is what I was talking about, Pastor Leon, a father. Stepping into position and leading well, a father responds to crisis different than the rest of the family. Neither one is weaker than the other. A woman is not weaker. Children are not necessarily weaker. But the father just has a job to do to function from a place of authority. Not greater value, but a place of authority. When a father walks into the room, you feel it, don't you? <laughs> Can I take you back a little bit to Bing Avenue? When dad would come home from work, you see, when, when we got the news about dad fighting this, this brain tumor, all kinds of memories came flooding back to me, some stories you might not know. And I remember when dad would come home and he would have two things, two things were always assured. Number one, he had a tie on. It was the days where you had to wear a tie. You were only anointed if you wore a tie. And uh, he would come home and he would have brute cologne. How many remember Brute Cologne? Who's wearing Brute Cologne this morning? <laughs> but Brute Cologne was, was, was meant to make you smell like a man. That's how it was advertised. You're, you're a brute with your cologne. And when dad would come walking into the house, you could smell the Brute Cologne. That's one of my earliest memories as a child. And, and the fragrance of a father came into the house. The fragrance. And when I could smell that dad was home, and some of you may have grown up with different smells, <laughs> but when I could smell that brute cologne come into the house, I knew dad was home, and I knew everything was in order, and there was a peace. There was something that just made the family when, when the father walked into the house. One of my earliest memories of my father, and you know what, this is very much how God is. Do you know that God is just as close as the mention of his name? Do you know that the fragrance of the Lord doesn't just fill a church building? But the fragrance of a father can come into your homes as we begin another journey of lockdown and all that's going on in the world. The world has maybe never been so unpredictable since World War II maybe. But the, the, the fragrance and the presence of a father can come into your home and can bless you can bring calm and peace in ways that medication or counseling or whatever isn't always able to, the presence of a father. I want you to practice something when, you, when you're at home over the next number of weeks, but when you gather to watch the service online, even before you turn it on, just gather your family together and welcome Heavenly Father into the house. And just say, Lord, we want the fragrance of Jesus. We want the anointing of the Father to come into the house. Would you just, just I know you, you're speaking in a mass, but just lift up your, your heads and just say, I love you, Father. Welcome the, the presence of the Father. Hallelujah. 
So point number one, I guess, is uh, a father is a foundation on which something great is built. A father is a foundation on which something great is built. Number two, a father is generous and wants to give an inheritance to sons. A father is generous and wants to give an inheritance to sons. You know, my dad has given me a lot over the years, and every moment he can, he tries to give to me. And I think you know Pastor Doug is a pretty generous guy, don't you? Very generous guy, legitimately true. And uh, I was teaching the other day on, online, and I was telling a story that always I, I hold very close to my heart. It was when I was little, my dad and I, we would sell hockey cards. We would sell sports cards. And we would buy these sports cards, and you could, you could get a lot of money from them. I think we bought our, our couches back then with sports card money. There was nothing illegal or didn't involve gambling or something. We just we bought cases of cards, and we actually got so good at it as a, as a father and son, we knew where in the case the boxes were that maybe had the money cards, okay? This is what your pastor was doing when he wasn't ministering. We were, we were doing things with sports cards. And uh, uh, so he would buy me some packs, and, and I was, I don't know, I must have been eight or ten years old, I don't remember, but eventually I had some cards that were money cards. They were worth a lot of money. And uh, one night my dad was going to a card show. And that's where you could go and sell cards with other people. And of course it was a school night so I couldn't go. And I think some people smoked there. So, so mom and dad wouldn't let me go with, with them. And of course again, a school night. So I stayed home and I remember when dad said to me, I'm going to go for you. And I'm going to sell those cards for you. And I'm going to come back home with some, with some money. And this was, this was a big inheritance for me. And you know what? Dad happened to sell all those cards. And, and my mom didn't really like this. I, I think my mom is watching, so this will hit really close to home. But Dad came home, and it was, it was sort of like the tooth fairy. I was already sleeping to get ready for school the next day. And when I woke up on the night table, there was $500. Oh! <laughs> something like $500 wadded up next to the night table. And that's just the way dad was. Dad is exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. And those, that wad of money was sitting there, and I'm sure my mom disagreed with that because I might have been too young to handle such an inheritance. But let me tell you something. That Saturday, I took that wad of money and I shoved it into my little shorts pocket, so grateful to my dad, and I went outside and I walked around to every garage sale I could find. I bought so many toys. I bought so much candy. I was the richest kid on the block. That's, that's the truth. And, and, and really, I didn't know how to steward what was given to me. But that was, that, that's dad. Generous. And you know what? Our heavenly father is the same way. That's always been a picture to me that's remained with me about our heavenly father. He wants to give you exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. We have trouble believing that. We wrestle with unworthiness. We wrestle with, would God go the extra mile for me? Let me tell you, he already did. He died for you. And this is just the way dad is. He's such a good example of the exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. I'm reminded this morning of the story of the prodigal son who asked for his inheritance too early, but when he came home, we see, you know, it's so much a story of a son who rebels, but it's more so of a story when you see the father's heart, that even as the son is returning from far off, the father welcomes him with a banquet, a meal, prepares the fatted calf. This is the heart of the father. And you think, I don't deserve that. I have sin in my life. I have a past. I have stuff. That's for some people. That's not for me. I'm telling you, it's for every one of us. It's the heart of a father who wants relationship with us. It's just God's nature. It's just dad's nature. I knew when to ask dad for candy when I was little. Right after service, after he'd preached a good message. I'd meet him at the altar. I'd, I'd be in the line just the same as you guys. 
And I knew when to ask dad for something because the generosity, he just exudes generosity. And it's a picture of the heart of the father. And it's a blessing to this house, isn't it? Let's keep going. So point number two was a father is generous and wants to give an inheritance to sons. And by the way, dad has given me more than $500. He's given me character, wisdom, (laughs) a number of other things. (laughs) Number three, a father wants to lift you up to see you succeed. A father wants to lift you up to see you succeed. This is another tough one for us, isn't it? Because there's all kinds of people watching online and sitting here. We come from all different walks of life. We come from skewed perspectives of, of our fathers. Psychology says that we tend to see our heavenly father the way we see our earthly father. Our experiences with our earthly father, good or bad, create sort of a filter of how we see God. And that's why we need the renewing of our mind, the word of God, to be able to catch a glimpse of this great and wonderful father who is invisible. We find him somehow in the visibility of Jesus Christ. And if we don't have Jesus here this morning to hold on to, we find him in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you can clap for that too. That's that's how we find God. We find his image. And oftentimes we struggle to believe that God wants us to succeed. I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel here. I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking about that inner knowing of success, the inner worthiness that comes from the affirmation of a father. When we don't have that affirmation from our earthly father, we tend to struggle to find it from our heavenly father. And you need to know this morning that God wants you to succeed. God is interested in your success. I don't like to use the word success, but God is interested in your significance. He's, he's interested in your inner assurance that you are loved, irrespective of what you do or do not do. A son or daughter is always accepted by the father during both good and bad. God wants you to succeed. Did you know that? I'm not, I know you got masks on, but look me right in the eyeballs. He wants you to succeed. The very first time I ever preached at this church was over in the family center, what's now the family center. Dad asked me to preach. I couldn't believe he asked me to preach. Now I preach fairly easily, but back then I sat at a desk and prepared notes and went over the notes and tore up the paper and started again preparing to preach on on Sunday morning. And on the Saturday, dad took me to the store and he bought me a suit. (laughs) We went to Moore's and he bought me a suit. And uh, I was so proud of this suit that my father had had bought me. He He was setting me up to at least look good, whether I preached well or not. And, uh, and I got this suit, and I remember that morning, I was terrified. I could barely eat the cornflakes. And, uh, and I put on this suit, and we were driving in the car, and, and I think my nervousness filled the car. It's a different kind of fragrance. My, my nervousness just filled up the car, and there was silence as we drove. And I remember exactly where we were on Taunton Road when Dad broke the silence as, as only he can. <laughs> And he said, he said, Derek, if you stink this morning, at least you'll look good. <laughs> if you don't, in other words, if you don't, if you didn't catch the word stink there, if you don't preach well, at least you'll look good. And you know, the tension just kind of lifted off of me. And I got up that day and preached, maybe not so well, because maybe the anointing wasn't so strong. I was young and learning. I got up there and preached well because a father was behind me. A father dressed me. A father wanted me to succeed. And you know what? The heavenly father, even though you got up this morning and you put on your clothes, you have those clothes because a father loves you. 
And I've got biblical basis for that because it says, if he cares as much to clothe the flowers, if he cares enough to feed the little birds, how much is your heavenly father interested in taking care of you? Now that deserves a hand clap. Give God a clap offering for how much he cares for us. He wants to support you. He wants you to succeed. One of the greater memories that came back to me as I've been praying and interceding for the health of dad was when he took me to a Maple Leafs game. My first Toronto Maple Leafs game. How many Leafs? Well, maybe I shouldn't ask that. <laughs> and they were playing the LA Kings back when, see this is a family chat, this is okay, right? I'm not going into deep theology here this morning. But uh, they were playing the L.A. Kings, and Wayne Gretzky played for the Kings at that time. And I remember sitting in the stands next to Dad, and I was so excited to be there. And, and Wayne Gretzky was tripped as he had, a, he had a breakaway, and he was tripped, which meant he got a penalty shot. This kind of penalty shot meant that everybody had to sit back and watch just Gretzky versus the goalkeeper. And I remember when Gretzky took off with that puck from that line all the way down towards the net, the crowd, I will never forget the roar of that crowd as they all stood up. Well, I'm just a little kid I can't see now. And I'm missing, I'm missing the moment. You know, I had the poster, the great one even though Jesus is the only great one. But, <laughs> but I had the poster. This was a moment to see Gretzky going down the ice, and I'll never forget his dad turned to me instead of the moment, and he picked me up and stood me on the chairs. Yeah. Yeah. He picked me up and stood me on the chairs so I wouldn't miss the moment. We as human beings do all kinds of things to hold on to a moment, to seize a moment, to make a moment, to strive for something, and we forget, Heavenly Father is not going to let you miss your moment. He's not going to let you miss your moment. He's going to pick you up. He's going to support you. He's going to help you to succeed. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. God is, is good. Let's quickly move to number four. A father is an example. A father is an example. Now this one's easy to say, so I want to add a little bit to it. A father is an example and lives consciously aware of this. The awareness that someone is watching you is important, isn't it? And there are fathers in life that aren't aware that people are watching. They don't live consciously from a place that their kids are observing everything. A father is an example and lives consciously aware of this. Many people live on, on autopilot. It's easy for us as men, as dads. It's weird saying I'm a dad. I'm part of this club now. I'm new, but I'm part of the club. <laughs> we just had our, our first daughter, Shiloh Grace Schneider. She's home probably crying right now, and her grandma is there with her. But we can tend to live on autopilot, and we forget that even if we don't have children, there are people watching us. But real fathers are keenly aware of the position they've been given by God through authority, they're aware that others are watching. They're aware of it in the car, when McDonald's doesn't get your order right. The kids are aware of it at home, how you relate to your spouse. I find myself sliding McDonald's into a lot of messages. <laughs> but they're watching what you do. I've always wanted to stand up here and tell you something about about Pastor Doug. That's not an exaggeration. This is the truth. I remember the time when dad sat down with mom, Andrea, and myself, and he said, I'll always be your dad, 
My heart belongs to you, but my heart also belongs to God. And I'm going to be spending some more time with the Lord. I might not always be around. I'll be there. I'll be your father, but some things are going to change a bit. And I watched as maybe we'd be watching a movie, and he would retreat to the bedroom or another room, and he'd be in the Word. I remember exactly when that began to happen. And through that, Holy Spirit began to move in this church in such a powerful way. And uh, it became a habit of him to sit in his chair. I can see him there right now, sitting in his chair, in the Word. So when he says that, that he's reading the Word, he's in the Word, and God spoke to him, you know, He's there. He's showing up. He's not talking about, hey, I was driving down whatever and, and, and I heard something or saw a bird fly by or something. He, he's in the prayer chair. Go to your father who is in secret. He's there. I'm telling you no word of a lie. If mom was here, she could testify to it. If Andrew was here, she could testify to it. Never missing an evening. No matter what time we got home at night, nine 10 o'clock, whatever, he would find himself in that chair in the Word studying. You've seen his Bible, blue, blue pen and everything written everywhere. Every single night, every single night in the Word. And he began to teach us and teach me. He said, I don't prepare for a message. I live a life of study and in the Word. And I began to live my life that way. Ready in and out of season because of a love for the Word, a love for the presence of God. It's one thing to prepare a message for a Sunday. It's another thing to embody the message for a lifetime. To embody the message for the example that you set for those who you have been entrusted to. That's why when Dad says he has a word, your ears should perk perk up. It's in the presence of the Lord. A father is an example. People are looking for an image to imitate. The Bible says that we were made in the image and likeness of God. Did you know that sons are wanting to imitate their father? In fact, where there is the absence of a father in the home, quite often those kids or those sons, they choose an image they can find to imitate. So you see a kid show up looking like this with, with tattoos all over or <laughs> an outfit like whatever. Chances are they're imitating a, a rapper, a movie star, some kind of superstar. Oftentimes they turn to a life of crime. They imitate gang leaders, gang members. You see, people are looking to imitate. They're looking for their image that's found within a father. And where there is the absence of the Father, there is a fragmentation of image. Even if you're sitting here right now or you're watching from from home, you might be fragmented in your image and you're saying, I've never understood who I am totally. I've never understood my image. I, I didn't have a dad. Let me tell you, God the Father is worth imitating. And you might say, you might say, you know what, I'm, 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 a little, uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with imitating God. I'm okay with imitating Jesus. Maybe you've come out of religion or something. Listen, the New Testament says, be imitators of God as beloved children. There's your image. Look to your heavenly Father. Oh, hallelujah. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. A father is faithful. Pretty simple, isn't it? A father is faithful. A father is faithful. I want to finish this morning on this point, and then I want to pray for you. And the presence of God is just going to fill your life. And if you're watching by live, the presence of God is going to fill your home. You get ready. You get ready. I want to talk to you quickly about a father who's faithful. I know that dad, again, being my example 
for this message this morning. It's not even Father's Day. But you can make any day Father's Day if you want to, can't you? <laughs> A father is faithful. I remember a number of years ago, my father and I didn't always agree on everything. Fathers and sons just don't always agree on everything. Turns out he was mostly right. <laughs> yeah, there's clapping. If you're watching dad, there's clapping going on in the house. <laughs> and you know, you see some TV episodes or movies of fathers and sons. Fathers and sons is a phrase that our culture understands. And uh, I remember when we were going through things that were ministry related. Ministry back then was kind of the compass. That was the be all and end all. Now that I'm a little older, I, I, I take ministry seriously. I have an international ministry. But I enjoy stopping and smelling the roses. I enjoy a walk with my wife. I enjoy a coffee. I don't need to build something big to feel affirmed as a man or as a son. I'm a little more relaxed, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, she's, okay, she nodded. So <laughs> I'm a little more relaxed. But somebody gave me wise counsel back then, and he, he said, Derek, one day your dad is going to get old, which was really hard for me to imagine back then. And may, dad, may you get as old as 99 or 102 in Jesus' name. <laughs> but this man gave me some advice and he said, Derek, one day you're going to bury your dad. May, may you never die, dad, but if you make it to 120 and we bury you. One day you're going to bury your dad, and he said, none of this ministry stuff will matter. Build relationship with him. And dad and I began to build our relationship and our friendship. And he began to support me in ways. We have a relationship now that's better than the days of hockey cards. And $500. It's a relationship that money can't buy. <laughs> he became my best friend. The one that I call. Anywhere I am in the world, I can call. And I still call. And I ask for advice. And this might be hard for some of you to hear or believe. But he pretty much always has the right answer. He always has the right answer. You see, Dad has been faithful even when we are not. Dad is a faithful man. I was born into anxiety. That was my struggle as a child. Anxiety has to do with trouble at birth. Something that you couldn't really counsel out of me. Something that just struggled with anxiety. Well, maybe Agnes could counsel it out of me. But, uh, <laughs> but struggled with anxiety. Separation anxiety. And uh, I was afraid to ride the school bus. This is a great picture of God the Father, so just stay with me. We're almost, we're almost done here. I struggled to, to ride the school bus, and I remember one morning my dad had to walk me to the bus stop. And we went to that bus stop and I was just terrified to get on that bus. I don't know why. We don't always understand our anxiety and our thoughts, do we? And uh, I remember like it was yesterday, dad would tell me to go up the stairs of the bus and all the kids are on there. They're watching this. Terribly embarrassing. And I'd walk. I remember walking up those steps and turning around and rushing back down. I don't know why. I was just terrified. And dad, being frustrated, he puts me back on, you know, get up there. He's trying to figure out, what do you do with a kid like this? <laughs> and I, I go up the steps, and I turn around and come back down. <laughs> and we did this for a while. The bus driver's waiting. The kids are waiting. Terribly embarrassing. Finally, he says, enough is enough, and he drives me to school in his car. And I remember this. Woodcrest Public School, 
<laughs> you know Woodcrest. Woodcrest Public School. This is kindergarten. And dad pulled the car up and he let me out. And what he said to me, and not just what he said, but what he did, became a plumb line and anchor for the image of the Father in my life ever since. You want to know what he said? He said, Derek, if you get scared when you go in there, you just come to the window of your classroom and you'll see me sitting out here in this car. And he had to go to work. <laughs> he was late for work that day. He was late for work that You can take it out of his next paycheck. He was, he was late for work that day. And to test it, you know how kids do. <laughs> To test it, I, I would go to the window and check, and there was that, I think it was an Oldsmobile or something, there was that car sitting there out front. Came back half hour later, there's dad sitting out there. And it's not like this was the days of cell phones or YouTube. When you sat in your car waiting, you really waited. You had nothing to look at but the windshield. And dad sat there just in case I needed a father. And I, I, I want to, yeah, yeah. And you can see how that easily becomes very foundational for, for a kid. I want to say this to you this morning, and I, I'll invite the worship team to come back. I want to pray for you in a moment, but the worship team can, can come back or a keyboardist or something. I want to say to you that God the Father has the car parked somewhere near your life. God the Father has stopped everything He's doing to be there for you. God the Father has a car parked somewhere near your situation, no matter how bad it is. Your situation might seem ridiculous. Mine was getting on a bus anxiety, but it was real to me. And your situation is real to you. Whatever it is, we all have situations. Only God knows all the situations that are, that are here this morning. I want to tell you something that I know as factual as, as I'm standing here. God the Father truly has a car parked next to your situation. And He's there. He's there. He's there. He's in it with you. He's the God who descended from heaven to come down to you, not you up to heaven. He's the God who came down on a mountain. He's the God who came down in an ark of the covenant. He's the Father who came down from heaven to earth. He came from heaven to earth. Don't play that song, but <laughs> he came from heaven to earth. He's literally the Father that comes to you. He's the God that comes down. And if it wasn't clear enough, and if he was scary with the thunder and the lightning and the stuff, if he was hard to comprehend, he converts himself into a physical man so that you can touch him and know him. No one has seen God at any time. See, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son has made him known. The Son has made the Father known. The Son of God translated the heart of a Father we could not see. A Father, if we got too close to, we might die. The Father is too holy. And Jesus Christ came and explained Him. You see, God came down to you. You know what a miracle is? A miracle is two things. I'm going to give you a definition you may have never heard. A miracle is something happening and you don't know how. Schneiderian definition. <laughs> a miracle is something happening and you don't know how. But you know what a miracle really is? A miracle is a happening from another dimension that breaks into this dimension and supersedes this dimension's normal. Let me word it differently. A miracle is a, 
is a, is a breakthrough from another dimension into this dimension that supersedes the governing laws and principles of this dimension. That's all a miracle is. That's why there's no miracles in heaven. It's earth that needs the miracle. It's you that needs the miracle. It's dad that needs the miracle. And God can break through. The Father can come down. And he can break through into your situation, and we call it a miracle. We look for the miracle. The miracle is the breakthrough from that realm. And that realm, I'm sorry, is unseen. I'm sorry that that realm can't be tapped into through an iPad. You can't see it on TV. You can't go there. There's no elevator to get up to that VIP place. So God comes down this morning when we worshiped, God came down. In your homes over the next number of weeks, God can come down. In your situation in the hospital, God can come down. I finished with this this morning. We were in the Philippines, and a woman was brought to the house with stage whatever, high stage cancer, stage three or something. She had a literal tumor inside of her. And they brought her to the house asking if I'd pray for her, and I was so tired. I had been doing so much training online. I was finally laying down on the bed watching Netflix. <laughs> That's when the, the call to pray came. Was I wasn't really prayed up. I was exhausted. I didn't really have the stuff, but God was about to come down. So I went sort of out of a courtesy. My, my wife came and got me. She'll nod her head. This is all true. My wife came and got me. We went into that room and there was the, the fear on the faces. The husband began to weep. Didn't want to lose his wife. And they asked me to pray for her and she sat there not knowing what to expect. And, and I took a hand that was just holding the iPad moments ago watching Netflix. A very natural hand. Nothing special about it placed it on her hand over this area here and just began to pray. You see, I came down to the room, but my coming down just isn't enough. There's times when even the doctor's coming down to your room and the report they give is not enough. You need your maker, <laughs> your creator, your image, your father to come down. And you know what happened? Something came into that room and this woman began to weep. The husband was weeping. And it was just after that she went to the washroom and passed the tumor. It was a profound miracle, right? Profound miracle. And the doctors, of course, having not checked her yet, still wanted her to come for the treatment, the chemo or whatever they were doing. So get this, she goes just to fulfill it. And by the way, this happened a while ago. The report is she's healed. She's fine. She's totally, I mean, they, they were so overjoyed, this family. Got, got their family back. Got their mom back, their wife back. And uh, so the doctor had her on the stuff. And, and it was amazing because she had no symptoms of the treatments. You're supposed to feel this way because of treatment, that way because of treatment. There were no symptoms and you know, when Pastor Leon gets up here this morning and he says, we're amazed at how well dad is doing. <laughs> it's really true. We're amazed at how well he's doing. He's the God of miracles. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. I want you to stand with me all over this place. And I want to give a, a call first with every head bowed and every eye closed. I never miss these opportunities. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to intentionally word it differently. I want you to know that for God so loved the world that he came down. For the Father so loves you that he came down. And if you're watching online, this is the part I want you to really pay attention to. Set the coffee down. Stop talking to the, to the kids or something and just focus in on this screen right now. It might be an eternal moment for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I take authority over all distractions that could be in your home right now if you're watching. The peace of God is over your home right now in the name of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he came down. He sent his son to pay a price that you could never pay 
so you could have relationship with a God that you can never reach in your own strength. Right back from the garden when he made the first man and woman, he loves you, wants relationship with you. When sin entered the picture, we lost relationship with our Father. And he was on a mission since that moment to get relationship back with you. The Bible says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We're born into it because of the sin of Adam and Eve. The Bible says no one is good. If you, comp- you, if you measure yourself by your standards or cultural standards, maybe you think you're good, but what about God's standards, who it really matters with? By God's standards, no one is good. All have fallen short of the glory of God. God doesn't want to send anyone to hell. He doesn't want you to go there. We're cursed to go there simply because of our sin. And so God brought a solution. The solution was he would come down and he would pay the consequence himself that you deserved. The consequence that you would have had to pay because of your sin, he came down and paid it. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we could be called the children of God. He wants to lavish his love on you this morning with every head bowed and all eyes closed. I want to invite you to come home to the Father. He's done everything he can. And he says, all that I ask is that you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you will be saved. If you want to come home to the Father this morning, just with every head bowed and eye closed, just slip your, slip your hand up high so I can see it and he sees it. Yep, some hands are going up. Just slip your hand up. You can see it. And those of you, while we're waiting for hands here, you want to come home to the Father. Just put your hand up high. I just want to make sure, yeah, I just want to make sure we see you. Yeah. And those of you that are watching online right now, those of you that have your hands up here in the building, you can put them down. Those of you that are watching online, if you want to come home to the Father, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to ask you to just write in the comment section, if you don't mind, just put, yes, Jesus. That's all you got to do. It's a confession. Jesus died publicly for you. He expects us to live publicly for him. If you're watching online now, or you're, even if you watch this broadcast later, and you want to receive Jesus Christ to come into your heart for the forgiveness of sins, just type, yes, Jesus, in the comments. Just type, yes, Jesus. And I'm going to pray for you right now, and out of courtesy for those who raised their hands, Uh, in the building and those maybe watching online, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. We're all going to pray it together. Are you ready for that? Just open your hands and open your hearts and just say, Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner and the penalty of sin is death. I believe that you died on a cross for me and you rose again on the third day. I believe you are the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world. Today I give you my sin. I give you my shame. Wash away all of my past sins. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And let me know the Father's love. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's clap our hands for those who are giving their life to Christ. Now for those of you with with father wounds, quickly. I know we're a little past time. If you're sick in body, God is going to visit you right now. Place your hand on yourself in the name of Jesus. Those watching online, place your hand on yourself. Anywhere you're sick. In the name of Jesus, I speak to every sickness, every disease, every body pain. I cancel your power. I command you out in the name of Jesus. Let go of God's people right now. I release a healing anointing to flow through your screen wherever you're watching from. I release a healing anointing in this house. Begin to do what you couldn't do before. Move around. Claim your healing this morning. The Father is here. Those with father wounds. You say, I didn't have the dad that you're describing and I've been left wounded because of it. Just open your hands, your hearts, and receive from the Heavenly Father right now. Receive His love. 
just for a few moments, receive his love. There's healings happening right now. There's healings of hearts happening right now. Just for the next few seconds, just receive the love of Daddy God this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you.